Hi, my name is Paul Sargent. Welcome once again to AP Euro Bit by Bit, the series in which I'm trying to teach you modern European history in small bite-sized pieces so that you can better understand it. And we are in test prep mode here. It's time to review for the exam. If you watched my last video, you saw sort of the big picture of what you can do to prepare for the exam. Now, we're going to start looking at the skills that you need in order to get ready for different parts of the exam. And today we're going to tackle the first part of the exam, the multiple choice section. So let's get going. So on the multiple choice section, you're going to have 55 minutes to answer 55 questions. One question a minute. That doesn't sound so bad until you realize that those questions, and you've probably been practicing this all year, are designed around stimuli. Stimuli could be passages from a primary source. They could be quotes from a secondary source written by an historian. They could be maps. They could be graphs. They could be charts. They could be paintings, sculptures. They could be, well, gosh, they could be just about anything. So the multiple choice section is going to be built around stimuli, each of which is going to have three or four or maybe even five multiple choice questions associated with it. Some of these refer directly to the stimulus, and some of these look at your general knowledge and your understanding of the basic flow of European history. So how do you go about attacking this thing? Well, first of all, let's just kind of get some of the anxiety out of the way. If you so if you do the math, there are 55 questions. They're divided evenly, supposedly, among four different historical periods, which doesn't exactly work numerically, but if you look on average, we're talking, what, 18 questions or so per time period? Boy, I hope my math is right on that. Anyway, um, 18 questions. And if we look at an average of maybe four questions per, uh, per stimulus, then you're looking at four or five stimuli that cover the entire period. That means that if you're looking at the first historical period from 1450 to uh, 1648, everything that includes the Renaissance, the Reformation, religious wars, the age of exploration, colonization of the New World, triangular trade, um, the uh, rise of absolutism, and the scientific revolution, there's going to be four stimuli maybe five stimuli that covers all of that. All right, are you starting to get the idea here? You don't need to know everything. This is not a trivia challenge. You focus on the big things. So in order to approach this section the best way possible, you have to understand a couple of things. Number one, the stimuli are there to either give you something to interpret or to put you in the frame of mind that will be able to drive the questions that come with it. But there are a lot of questions that you can answer without even looking at the stimuli. So my advice is, number one, look at the questions first. See what's being asked. You might be able to answer two or maybe even three of the questions without even reading the, the passage that's up there. If that's the case, great. That's fantastic. Then you can direct your reading. But even if you can't answer a single one by looking at it, understand that you then know what you're looking for. And you can read the passage or look at the chart or whatever it is more critically and more focused. And you look for what it is that's being asked. Following that, it's really important to understand that it's efficient on a test like this to eliminate wrong answers. Wrong answers typically will fall into a few different categories. There are going to be wrong answers which are simply out of time period. They're at the wrong time. They're talking about a person who was born 300 years after what we're talking about. Or they're talking about an idea which has nothing to do with this place or this time or this thing or this trend or whatever. Take those out immediately. They're just, they're in the wrong place. 
there are also going to be answers which are completely irrelevant to the question. And if you're familiar with European history, you'll be able to pull those out right away. Because you'll say, oh my gosh, there are, it's just as irrelevant, has nothing to do with it. And you can knock that out. Then you're going to be left with, a, with two answers, or if you're lucky, one. If, you're, well, if you've got one, you fill in the bubble and you move on. If you've got two, then you need to start using your common sense. And this is where I have to emphasize a point. Common sense, and you're thinking through questions, is intimately tied with your ability to talk yourself out of the right answer. I advise my students, don't go back and change your answer unless you find that the question has an accept and like, you, did, you didn't see it and so you answered like, oh yeah, that one's true, yeah. Go back and change it. Otherwise, don't go back and change it because your gut is probably right on this one. Don't talk yourself out of it. Look at the answers you have left. Decide which one makes absolute sense. There will often be a distractor answer, which makes sense in a limited context, but doesn't make absolute sense. And if there's one that makes absolute sense and one that you're thinking, well, this could be right, or this sounds good, or something like that, and one that you say, well, you know, this just kind of seems obvious, that's what, you know, this is, this is what it is, then, you know, go with the obvious one. Don't talk yourself out of the right answer. Now, of course, pacing is important here. And as you go through this section, understand that there are going to be points in history that you might be weak on. If you run into a set of questions that's about a period that you don't know a lot about, why don't you skip it? Because you're going to be pressed for time. And go and work on the ones that you know the time period pretty well and that you can do pretty well on. And then go back to the ones where, eh, you're a little iffy or maybe you just checked out for that, for that period or whatever. And if you do that, then you're going to maximize your points. But whatever you do, whatever you do, don't leave any answers blank. At the end of the exam, this 55 minutes, if you've got, you know, eight questions sitting there and one minute left to go, I hate to say this because it sounds so wrong, but bubble something in. And don't just go see. That's, that doesn't work a lot. But bubble something in. Just go for it because they, you don't get any penalty for guessing wrong answers and you might hit some. Who knows? You got a 25% chance statistically. So basically on the multiple choice, just try to relax. Answer what you can before reading the stimulus. Go through and look through the passage or look at the map or something like that and use your common sense and your knowledge of European history to be able to eliminate the answers that you know are wrong and then decide logically between what's left. If you're able to do that and you're able to do that at a decent pace, then you're going to do well on the AP exam's multiple choice section. And that's 40% of the exam. So you're off to a good start. So as always, this is AP Euro Bit by Bit. My name's Paul Sargent. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe so that you can get notified when I post the next video about short answer questions, and go back and check out the old videos that have content in them. You might enjoy them. But for now, thanks for watching, and have yourselves a great day.